well that that helps uh, helps me address some of the issues. And, and those were the areas that I really concentrated on when I was in the state senate was healthcare and education because uh, that's what my background was in. So why did I uh, go from the governor's race to the uh, the uh, congressional race? I started off in the governor's race because uh, I just didn't think there was any adult leadership uh, in Carson City at the time. Um, you know, there was a lot of problems uh, when the last session was in play. Um, even during the first, the, my last session in 2007, there wasn't a lot of direction, there wasn't a lot of coordination. It, it was just a very difficult time. I think part of that was because, um, like I said, it just wasn't adult supervision. Uh, and then I, I listened to the State of the State address in January, and I thought, you know, there's, there's no vision here for the state of Nevada. And uh, that's when uh, I thought about getting into the governor's race, did a kind of a statewide tour and talked to folks out in the rural counties and all around the state, and was encouraged to get into the governor's race, which I did. I should say that even before that, though, I had people asking me to consider getting into the Congressional District 3 race just because of my background and, and the things that I have expertise in. But I didn't want to because I, I have a total road way at home. And uh, I didn't want to be a commuter dad again. Uh, we figured out that this year was the first year uh, that I've been home more days than I've been away since he's been born. Whether it was due to military deployments or going to Carson City or being on the road for work. And I kind of like being home. Uh, so from a, a totally selfish standpoint, I said, no, I don't want to do CD3. Uh, we had a candidate that entered the CD3 race, John Guidry, uh, who would, was a great candidate. But he had to withdraw due to a, a medical issue within his family that just wasn't going to allow him to put the effort into the race that, that was going to be necessary. And so when he withdrew, or in the process of his withdrawal, I started to receive several phone calls from the same people that were asking me in January, uh, saying, Joe, we really need for you to, to reconsider. Um, this is the race for you. This is Look at the issues right now that are being discussed and look at your background. Uh, we really think that you'd be the best candidate uh, for CD3. So we did a lot of soul searching, talked to a lot of folks within CD3, did a Facebook poll, everybody, everything's on Facebook nowadays, did a Facebook poll, what do people think? Uh, and overwhelmingly, the response was, uh, go, go to CD3, that's, that's where we need you. Now I just had to convince my wife. Uh, so we sat down and, and talked about it again, and, and it was actually my wife who made the decision. I had to tell people, she always makes the decisions, I just show up where she tells me to show up. Um, and she said, look, Here's what it comes down to. You know, the family is always sacrificed whenever you've been called. You've gone act, you've been active duty three times, we were here without you. You went to Carson City for two sessions, we were here without you. Uh, but it's this, so it's not only the, the sacrifice of the person who's serving, but the sacrifice of the families that they leave behind. And she said, you know, if this is the right thing for the state, if it's the right thing for the nation, then we'll sacrifice again and we'll be here and they'll go to Washington. And it'll be like active duty, except that you'll be home on the weekends. Uh, so, with that kind of a support from my family, uh, we decided to make the switch, and so that's what we did. And so we're about a month in now to uh, the CD3 race. And I think it was a good transition for me, again, because of the issues that are currently under debate. We've done uh, five healthcare town halls in Southern Nevada. And, and I do them as a non I do them as a nonpartisan town hall. I'll tell you what I think is good, and I go in as a healthcare person. I'll tell you what I think are good in the bills, and I'll tell you what I think are bad in the bills. And I think part of the issue that a lot of people got concerned about on, on the healthcare, ref, healthcare reform is that they just don't understand what's going on. And if you ever tried to read one of those bills, you, unless you have a law degree, uh, you're not going to understand those bills. And so I thought it'd be beneficial to kind of explain some of those things. And I, because I don't have a life, I did actually read those bills. Uh, I read H.R. 3200, which is 1,018 pages. Um, I just finished the Senate Finance Bill that was released last week. That's a little over 1,500 pages. Uh, but I think it's important to be able to go through and say, look, here are some of the good things and here are some of the bad things. And so those are the town halls that we held. And I did one in Perrant. And uh, this sweet little 80-year-old lady came up to me and she goes, Dr. Heck, all I got is one question. Are there really death panels in those bills? She goes, because I'm pushing 80 and I don't think I'm going to make the cut. And that was her biggest concern. Uh, because of the things that were being played in the media about what is and what is not in, in, the, in those uh, bills and pending legislation. So, so we did five of them, and they were bipartisan. Uh, we had people from uh, 
Republican, Democrat, and Independent show up and offer their opinions. And I think they went very well. And I was, I was disappointed that we didn't see more of those town halls from the folks actually in Washington who are going to be voting on these bills. Um, that allowed people to actually express their concerns uh, in, in an unfiltered environment. Uh, and, and that's what prompted, we started ours back in August and have been going all the way through. Uh, so it's that, but that type of um, expertise that I want to bring to Washington, that type of relationship that I want to have with my constituents. They, I got into uh, this, the uh, Senate District 5 race in 2004 solely because the senator who was serving at that time didn't respond to me. Um, I was at that time in 2003, I was on another active duty tour. And if you were in the state at that time, you remember they were talking about a big tax hike uh, in the legislative session. And so I kept thinking in my uh, state center, saying, what's going on with this bill? Where are you on this bill? I wanted to stay informed, even though I was deployed. I never once got an email response, not once. Um, my wife, who was here, actually called the individual uh, to ask for an explanation uh, on a vote that she made. And my wife was told, I don't owe you an explanation. And I thought, you know, that's not the person who's representing me. I don't know if she's representing anybody else in Senate District 5, but it doesn't seem like she's representing me uh, and my family. And so that's, that's why I picked that seat, saying that this person does not appear to be representing the folks in Senate District 5. And I, when I ran, I prided myself on constituent service. And I'll tell people even to this day that if you email me or call me, I'll respond within 24 hours. It may be another email back saying, I don't, I don't know, I'm researching it, I'll get back to you. Uh, but you will get a response within 24 hours to let you know that I've received your concern and that I'm working on it. And, and that's the type of constituent service that I want to provide uh, when I get to Washington, D.C. as well. So those are, that's kind of my, my background in brief, why I'm, I'm running for C3, the issues that I think are critically important. Um, and I think that I'd rather just spend the rest of the time hearing from you and, and answer any questions that, that you all might have. So is there anybody that question or otherwise I guess I can continue to tap dance up here for yes. think you can sign anything that's going to do away with the Constitution. I think there are certain treaties that are under consideration where certain folks think that it, it, it um, infringes upon U.S. sovereignty. One of them was a recent uh, maritime law treaty that was under consideration. Uh, but I don't know of anything currently that's being debated that would take away the Constitution nor infringe on the Constitution through a treaty with other countries. service? Well, I think there's that's a, a great question, and I, I think there's a lot that we can do, and we're, we're making some inroads here in Southern, I mean, Southern Nevada is like a black hole for veteran services. Um, one of the issues is that we don't have enough, uh, at a state level, veteran service officers to help our veterans timely get their benefits. Um, the ratio here is about 33,000 veterans per veteran service officer. You compare that to a state like West Virginia, which has got about 3,000 per VSO. A state like Florida has got 5,000 per VSO. So 33,000 veterans per uh, service officer. The other thing is the delay in getting service. The average wait time for a veteran here to meet with the VSO is 42 days. In West Virginia and Florida, it's one day uh, because of those ratios. And I think, well, now that's going to cost money if we're going to have more veteran service officers. Well, yeah, it is. But you don't understand it. For every veteran that we get benefits for, that brings money back into the state. Right now, in uh, veterans' retiree benefits, just retiree benefits, that's $14 million a month that comes to the state in veterans' retiree benefits for people to have. So it's critically important that we have the infrastructure to make sure that, that veterans are able to navigate the very complex bureaucracy of being able to get the benefits that the 